And welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Bubba and the Bat Flip, episode 108. Wrapping up our positional reviews as we're combining starting pitching and relief pitching tonight. Just do pitchers, which is convenient on the Rasball Player Editor because you can just do all the pitchers into one. And uh, it'll help us get through this because before you know it, it's time for positional previews as we get closer and closer to what we hope to be the fantasy baseball start of the season. Uh, before we get to that, some house find me at Patrick. Coast is always on Twitter at Batflip Crazy. Toby, how are you doing, man? Uh, doing well, Bubba. My um, so I'm in. I'm trying to. I'm trying. I should be joining an FBC draft soon. I started Ooh. our our draft restarted this afternoon, unbeknownst to me. So I was like on the clock. This is the the first pitch Arizona draft, and we did the. I think we drafted the first twenty three rounds. Yeah, I think and we're like on that. like on yeah. like round 24 or something like that. And my pick was up. I had no idea what to do. I haven't done any drafts. I was just like, uh, I know I this is what I I need a guy who plays this position. And um, but it'll be fun to get into it. It's a good reminder that I have a lot of work ahead of me and a lot of work um to do to prepare. But I'm excited, you know, to get started. I've been waiting um is a little public service announcement for those of you who want to use the ACH feature mm -hmm. on NFBC. This isn't a criticism, but I started the ACH process on December 31st and mm -hmm. my money is supposed to hit my account on uh, Thursday, on January 13th. Now it's just because we're going through banks and I happen to send it on a Friday and the banks are only, you know, Monday through Friday or whatever. So I probably have like the longest period of time, but it's like four to five days on each, four to five business days on each end of the transaction, like for your bank to, to send the money and then from the money to, to be received and to be entered into your account, like literally half a month is going to go by between those. So if you are trying to put your money into the NFBC using the ACH functionality, and especially you haven't set it up, so you have to like verify the amount that they send first, I would highly recommend giving yourself at least two weeks uh, in order for that process to work out. I'm not quite sure it is worth the credit card fees. Uh, although for some purchases, for some money, the amount of money that some people are shifting over, I'm sure. Yeah, would. yeah get the points. Get the points for some of those guys. I could see it being yeah. a, a useful thing. I just use PayPal. PayPal works for me. We, we mm. rock and roll with PayPal. I'm in and out before it's uh, before you know what happens. But um, now, now, do you have the do you have the charge though? Do you have like the nope. percentage charge? Really? Yeah, oh, they've never asked me. It's like you know, you're talking about like when you send to friends and family and stuff. Um, no, never... no, no. Like when um, for NFBC, do you oh, use, the, do you the use service PayPal? charge the service charge or whatever? Yeah, yeah. But that's why like, I buy the I buy the bundles. The bundles, the three packs, yeah. you, only, you only get charged once, type thing. I know. I bu I'm buying like a bundle for for the DCs, and it's like, you know, I it's like the service charge was like thirty bucks or something. I was oh, like, so yeah, oh, no, it's it's, not, I, it's nothing like that. I want to avoid like, that for the credit card. Yeah. Yeah, no, mine's not nothing like that. It's like I think if I can NFC fifty, it's like a couple dollars. I'm like, okay, yeah. let's just go. Let's just <laughs> let's put it on PayPal. Let's go. But um, you can even do a three pack of those, and then you only pay the one fee. So it's yeah. it's easy to to make that work and uh, and see how it goes. But I could see yes, if you're playing with the big big boys, you're gonna want to uh, save some of those fees for sure. Done. See, might do two more. We'll see. I got some OCs coming up. It's gonna be a big year for me compared for sure. to usual. So uh, we're, we're 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 seeing what's happening, but it's fun. Um, you're gonna start dipping your toes in, and I'm going to. I think I keep telling myself this and then people keep sending me like, Hey, come join this league. Come join this league. And I'm like, and they're, they're not fab leagues. So I'm not worried like in that regard to it. And they're great learning tools. Like they've helped me a ton, but I'm at the point now where I think I want to just kind of sit back and reevaluate things for like the rest of January and then go back in February and start going again. Cause you learn a lot as, it, as you go through these drafts, like your strengths, your weaknesses and so forth. So I'm debating that I'll probably still do like a 50 here and there. Cause they are really like, I'm finding myself liking 12s way more than 15s. I know you like 15s way more than 12s. Mm -hmm. So it's going to bring a fun dynamic to the the pod during the season because we're going to have like two different mindsets on approaching certain fab periods and stuff, which will be be fun for sure. But I, I've found myself the 15s, man. We know it's deep, but it's disgusting, absolutely disgusting. Like Zach Waxman and myself, we, we we've been in each DC to get season every turn. It's either him or Fish in every freaking one, and. um he sends me messages and it's like 
he's gone so deep in these. He's having them put players in the player pool for him. Yeah. That's how ridiculous the 15s are. So just keep that in mind if you're going to step into that arena. Not Toby. Toby knows this. But anyone else that gets there, it's fun for like 30-ish rounds. And then it starts getting real murky real quick. So... I mean, I love taking Brett Anderson and in, in on the in, in at pick seven fifty. I mean, that really makes me happy. I've uh, mine's not the seven fifty pick, but I now have two shares of Patrick Corbin, which I never oh, thought nice. I would have because he's going super late. He's going to get innings. He's a great like draft and hold pick. Like you can stream him. Maybe he figures it out because we talked about the profile a couple weeks ago. Like. It, the profile wasn't much different than the past, but there's a couple like quote unquote maybe unlucky things. Maybe he just really it's going bad for him. I don't know. But if he just somehow turns it back just a little like a lot like a John Lester type thing, we're doing good. So that's that's my mindset at that point in the draft. That's he's got to kind of switch off the gears of you don't need to play this guy technically. Like if everything goes your way, you never even put him in your lineup if things go right. But that's not the way baseball works, as we know. But that that's the beauty of it. So yeah, Brett Anderson. I've looked at some names. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. It's just like if people saw the from the if, if loyal listeners saw some of the players I'm picking, they'd be like, "You're such a liar." <laughs> but this is a different. This isn't a fab league. This is different. <laughs> this is a different beast. But um, I look forward to you jumping in the arena because we can start comparing your thoughts on it. Because like I said, I've been dabbling here and there for um, probably over a month now but um i love it it's the nfc format's pretty legit pretty good yeah pretty good stuff. yeah you'd be proud of me i'm really cutting back my leagues i think i'm gonna have eight fab leagues this year well see that's my thing because i'm not gonna have a ton of fab leagues i'm with you less. There. yeah i'm trying to limit the fab i'm with you 100 percent there it's um I'm, that's why i'm willing to do these 50s and stuff early just to kind of do things I've already jumped in one fab league because a very nice person asked me to come into it for their listener league. So I did it. It's fun. It's great, but I can't be doing too many of them because I want to do my, like you, I want to focus on the ones that are going to hopefully do more dam do more good than damage type thing. So for we'll sure. See. All right. Enough uh, people. This is what we do before the show. Usually we talk about all this stuff. So now you guys are getting a little behind the Oof. curtains of what Toby and I chat about. But uh, like I said, we're going to talk pitchers and then as usual, Rasball Player Raider. We'll do some more behind the curtains. Toby, what do you want to do for the dates for our um, – you want to do all December and uh, into January, just the last month? Yeah, let's just do the last Let's just do the last month. Okay, so like December 11th to January 11th. All right, we'll do that. As usual, folks, we draft champions ADP. It'll be for the pitchers, of course, as we're going through there. We'll be talking about too much ADP. It'll be more of a reference point. Uh, but we will be using the Rasball Player Raider to talk pitchers. And Toby and I kind of mentioned it last week. We're not going to talk about the common sense ones. Like there's Max Scherzer. Oh, yeah, no duh. He was the number one earner in all of baseball. Yeah, okay, we got you. We're going to kind of highlight the more maybe surprise guys. Like when we, we drafted in, in last February and March, we didn't expect them to be up here where they are. So we're going to kind of highlight them, see what they did this past season that, that made them earn what they earned for us. So we will kick things off. Skipping over Max Scherzer, who was number one. Number two was Liam Hendricks. So, Toby, a closer was number two on this list in, in dollars earned. That says a lot about how good Liam Hendricks was. Walker Bueller was third. But the first name we are going to discuss this evening, Julio Urias, came in at fourth at $27.90. Max Scherzer is $31.40. So, it wasn't that far off in the grand scheme of things. Drafted a lot later than Max Scherzer. And, like, my biggest issue is I was worried about innings pitched because – 55 innings in 2020, 79 in 2019. He threw 185 innings in 2021, and he was great. We, I don't think we've ever doubted the quality of Julio Urias. I was so concerned about what's the workload going to be. And I don't know if it's because the Dodgers had so many injuries, they just didn't have a choice in the end, or they just said, screw it, this kid's good, and he's recovered from his injury, and we're going to roll. Bottom line is he was filthy, ERA below three. Um, really, really good stuff from Julio Urias. Yeah, exactly. I think what you mentioned is obviously the case. People didn't expect him to throw as many innings as he, as he did, and he did that. And not only that, but he won uh, 20 games. So yeah. he started 32 games, which is about the max that you're going to get this uh, these days. And he won uh, 20 of them. And he was pretty consistently pitching at like five or six innings. I think he only had, he had, I, I think I looked at this before. I think he only had one start. Yeah, one start all season that went less than five innings, which is kind of amazing, you know, just because there's so many different reasons why you can do that. You get the pitch count up too high. 
you get injured, you don't throw well, <laughs> and he only managed to do that once. I think the major change, you know, just looking at his profile, like the walk rate was down way below what he's traditionally been at. Um, he was getting ahead of batters more. He was pounding the zone, which is something similar to what he did in 2020. He had a 47.4% zone percentage. And then he was also getting swings and miss or swings outside the zone. So he was turning balls into strikes um, at a much higher rate than he did in 2020 when he had that kind of higher, higher walk rate. Um, the swinging strike rate went up. The swinging strike rate was, or not the swinging strike rate, the K rate went up. The swinging strike rate was about the same. Um, CSW was about the same, like a little bit up by like 1.5%, you know, and nothing dominating there, like 11.2% swinging strike rate, uh, 29.7 on the CSW. So nothing overpowering, but the, the end result was that 21.1% K minus walk rate, which is really good. I mean, the wins are really what propelled the value to be what it was. And you can't necessarily count on that happening again. But there are certainly worse situations than than the Dodgers to to bet on somebody getting a decent chunk of wins. So interesting, uh, definitely like an interesting profile. I think a lot of things went his way this year on a variety of different fronts. I don't anticipate uh, that he's going to repeat it, but you never know. Yeah, that's my biggest concern. Like, I'm kind of bummed that I didn't buy him last year because I always believed in the talent. It was just I was 100. percent It's like you know what, where he's going in drafts, I'm getting guys with innings yada 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 and he proved me massively wrong and whoever drafted him got the dividends for it but i'm again going into to current drafts now knowing where he's going in drafts going is he gonna throw 190 again like it, it seems like they're gonna have to scale him back but you never know he's young the dodgers might be without options again like we went into last season saying how deep they were and then by the end of the season they were barely skipping together a starting five so that's baseball for you and you just never know how them breaks happen all right, after Urias, you had Zach Wheeler. Uh, Garrett Cole was sixth. Corbin Burns was seventh, which to, to some might be surprising because he was so dominant. He's, it's like Cole and Burns, the top two pitchers off draft boards right now. But Burns is the seventh pitcher. Still very, very good. Don't get me wrong, but I think it might surp surprise some people seeing him at seven. You had Robbie Ray at eight. But the next guy I want to talk about is not so much that he pitched well because a lot of people were on him. I want to bring him up because I said I was full fading him last year. So I'm going to eat some crow on this one. But the ninth best pitcher was Kevin Gossman, who made you $24.60, uh, right behind Robbie Ray's 25. So Gossman was outstanding. He made 30 starts. So he got out there 192 innings. Another one of those, I think there's like eight or nine total pitchers that got over 190 or something. I might be, I know it's in the ballpark there. Strikeouts were great again. The ratios, he, a 2 8 1 ERA, like with a 3 FIP and a 3 2 8 X FIP, he wasn't even that far. Like even if those were reality, outstanding ratios. Like he was. Absolutely filthy. I thought the, the splitter was just too much to be that consistent for that long. Proved me wrong. The ballpark worked out well for him. He was great. He was absolutely phenomenal. I just want to bring him up because um, I, I'm gonna. This is me eating my crow. He was great, and I'm very mad that I passed up on him in pretty much every draft. Yeah, I mean, will the Giants be mad that they passed up on signing him to a longer term deal? Yeah, possibly for sure. We'll, we'll see. I mean, obviously the context that he's going to now is a little bit different with the Blue Jays. Although, you know, the Orioles are changing their ballpark dimensions. I think there's been a, a decent amount of talent has left the AL East. Um, and I don't, I'm not thinking of like any major guys have that moved over there. There's obviously a lot more to the seat, to the off season to take place, but it'll be interesting to see um, you know, what happens in that respect, but yeah, I mean, he was, he was fantastic again. Um, you know, I think the Velo was actually down slightly. That was one of the reasons why in 2020 he took that jump, but swinging strike rate at 15.3%, the K minus walk at 22.8, you know, the chasing outside the zone, he increased his split finger fastball usage, um, last year again. So he was at, was just looking at it. Um, he was at 38% for that, for that splitter, 52% fastballs, just throwing that slider and the change just a tad. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, he was, he was fantastic. There's nothing that like really jumps out at me as being that off. He did have his lowest homer homers per nine 
you know, which the ball did get a little bit deflated last year. So maybe, maybe that has something to do with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was all relatively reasonable, a little bit of batted ball luck, 274 BABIP, you know, which is the lowest of his career by a decent margin. So certainly a little bit of room for regression, but he did, he did great. Yeah. He proved me extremely wrong. I think there will be regression. I think it'd be more like the 2020 Gosman, which is still outstanding, but you're getting it more like the three, three ish ratios, the three, five, probably just, just by the, the AL East, they, they did lose guys, but it's still the AL East. And there's a chance the way things are going right now, Toronto might be in Dunedin again to start the year. So just keep that in mind also, mm. which would make, you know, a lot of things a little different, not saying it's going to happen, but the way things are moving might be kind of back to that, you know, things get better during the summer and then they kind of just might be the way we live for the next little while. So um, there's a good chance they start the year in Dunedin if, if things go that way. And that that's not going to help anybody out at all. So mm. just little things like that. I think he's gonna be phenomenal, but um, I just wanted to bring it up because we do keep ourselves accountable on this show. Mm. Um, the number 10 pitcher, our second relief pitcher, Rossiel Iglesias, uh, Rysel Iglesias. He's been great back with Anaheim this year. So he should be another big year on tap. One of the top four closers off the boards in current drafts, but number 11, we're going to go stick right here as it's getting, we got, we got a bunch of names coming up. We're going to go bang, bang, bang with, but uh, the number 11, Pitcher off the board, another starting pitcher, $22.70. The ageless wonder, let me get this correct, 40 years old right now, turned 40 in August, Adam Wainwright. Adam Wainwright pitched 206 innings this past year, which is, I bet you, the over-under in Vegas is probably like 135 or something, 140. He pitched 206, 32 starts, 17 wins which was tremendous. He had a 3.05 ERA, which in 2020 in a short season had a 3.15 ERA. Um, he was great. He was phenomenal. Not a big strikeout guy, but that's what we know with Wainwright. Uh, but even like the, the the left on base rate was similar to last year. Ground ball rate was outstanding. Home run to fly ball got even lower. By no means am I expecting this same thing in 2022, 20, uh, but Adam Wainwright, Every year, I think it's his last year, and then he does something like this. It was really, really impressive. It goes to show you there's a lot to be said about old pitchers that don't care about sticky stuff mm -hmm. and old pitchers that just know how to pitch, not know how to throw. There's a lot to be said about that, and he proved it this last season. Yeah, I mean, the volume is obviously huge, throwing over 200 innings. And then <clears throat> the ratios, I mean, it's hard to see him being able to replicate this, but... At this point in time, like, would you really want to doubt the guy? Um, you know, the the K minus walk at 15%, you know, that's pretty much the identical to what it was in 20 in the shortened season in 2020, you know, right around league average, slightly better than league average, but no swinging strikes, you know, absolutely dominated in the zone, like 90.4% in zone contact, 81.3% overall contact rate. So I think even that 21% K rate might be a slightly, slightly, um, uh, a bit of an issue there. You know, the, the home runs per nine were the lowest that they've been in, you know, a number of years in six years. So it feels like a season where, you know, everything kind of went right that could. And I doubt that that happens again, but if you can throw 200 innings again and he's in the mid to high, you know, threes in terms of ERA, he's also a guy that benefits tremendously from the context, both pitching in St. Louis and also just having that defense behind them. So it's a very unsexy, it may be the unsexiest pitch you could possibly pick, you could possibly make. And I do think that, you know, I would guess that his season next year will be a decent amount worse than this one was, but he's certainly been consistent and um, volume means something in today's game. Volume means a lot of things. You're, you are correct there. The, the biggest dilemma um, is he's picked 210 this year. Unlike last year, he was basically like a late round pick, like one of your last picks. So now it gets to be like, is he this year's before he went bad? Is he like he had the new Kyle Hendricks? Okay, we're just going to take you for stability. Like we're going to like, you're going to be my, sp5 and we're just gonna just go out there and you know just don't get blown up basically just go out there and get me decent numbers of like accumulate be an accumulator go do your thing it's not a bad idea especially especially it basically depends on 
how you're building your team is probably one way to go about it. But I could see it because where he's going in drafts, it's it's interesting. Because you got like the flashy pod, uh, Patrick Sandoval, who people love. You got Desclafani, Jordan Montgomery, uh, a lot of guys going around him there. That it's like, do you want to take these younger guys with you know maybe more upside potentially? Or do you want to make the boring veteran, a.k.a. like we talked about Kyle Hendricks for years, which one do you want? And that's going to be a fun one to watch uh, in this ever-evolving landscape of the ADP world. All right, the 12th starting pitcher off the board got you $22.10. That's Carlos Rodon. Big big reason people like Phil Dusso and others did very, very well because they got him for free in drafts. People didn't even want to touch him because you never knew his injury situation. And he's always getting – he got hurt a couple times this year. He didn't really finish the year – very positively, but he did make 24 stars for 132 innings, struck out everybody. His strikeout stuff was just insanity. Um, very good left on base rate, right? the best of his career, so you got to expect some regression there. But the um, the ratios were excellent, and like I said, the strikeout rates, it was asinine what he was doing on the mound. Almost 35% strikeout rate, his career best prior to that was 29.1. He had almost a 28% K to walk rate. These numbers were through the roof, and a lot of it was the increased velocity. That's one reason why people liked him going into this, the, uh, the season last year. That was a big spring training thing. I know you're a big spring training velocity guy, and he was one of those guys for sure. He checked that box. Um, it was always a health thing for me. Those that took the chance on him, they won. So what's your thoughts on uh, Rodon from last season? Yeah, I mean, he was, he was wonderful uh, to have on your team. Again, you know, a lot of kind of best of your career type stuff. You mentioned the strand rate, the L, um, left on base percentage at 82.2, which is really high. And then the BABIP at the lowest at 267. But the K minus walk rate, like the strikeout stuff, like you mentioned, was just out of this world. He was getting chases on pitches outside the zone, which has been a real challenge for him and helped him, him have the career low walk rate. But it's all about injuries with him. So he threw 132 and and two thirds innings last year. I mean, what are the chances that he comes back and does that again? Given you know the arm trouble that he struggled with towards the the end of next year. Obviously, the White Sox chose not to offer him a, the qualifying offer. Whether his health had something to do with that, I, I don't know, but I would presume so. But the velocity gains were the big thing, and I can't say it enough a lot of the guys who broke out this year are velocity gain gainers like robbie ray was the same way um carlos rodon was the same way and in both of those cases they were touted in the preseason as having gained velocity and sometimes it's hard to get really accurate readings in spring training for velocity but you know that's what it's worth going after those guys changing your draft plans and adapting to go after the guys that have that velo bump because it can make a massive difference. I mean, he went up by two and a half miles per hour, which is very unusual, Huge. but it just makes all the difference. And so that I think is it for me is the biggest thing during spring training is just monitoring velocity and making sure and looking for those kind of extremes of changes either down or up. Um, either as a sign of injury or potentially a breakout season. There's other guys like Sean Manaya, you know, who was similar, like, and he didn't have the season that I think he could have if he ha- if he was a little bit more lucky, but oh well. Um, but yeah, Rodon was 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 fantastic, but it's it's hard to it's hard with the injury stuff in the background. Yeah, it, it's murky. He's, he's a free agent right now, so if you're doing drafts right now, you really don't know what's going on because you don't a you don't know how healthy he is because he's not really rehabbing anywhere, and b you don't know where he's going to land. Like, did the Rays sign him and make him a three inning opener? He'd be perfect for that. Uh, that makes so much sense for him, but that doesn't help us a ton. So it's a, it's a weird dynamic. I, I assume he's going to go somewhere to start. That's why he re-signed with Chicago last year. That's part of the deal of they're going to give me a chance to start instead of. Teams offered him bullpen rolls, and he said no. So we'll have to see how that one plays out. Next up on the agenda, we'll pass over Josh Hader, our third relief pitcher off the board. He was 13th overall. To go to number 14, a 38-year-old pitcher, another ageless wonder here in Charlie Morton. Every year you think he's going to retire, he signs somewhere else and gets the job done. He made um, 33 starts, second straight 33 start season, or third straight 30-plus start season of the last three full seasons for Charlie Morton. Just keeps pumping out those innings, 185 innings. He's basically gone 167 or more in each of the last three full seasons. Another massive strikeout guy, good ratios. 
you just go back and look at his numbers. He's very, very consistent overall. Like he's had a couple hiccups here and there, but overall, mid to high three ZRA, decent whips, strikeouts, you know, over 10K per nine, decent walk rates. Like this is what Charlie Morton does. And um, he did it again for Atlanta. And I don't see him, honestly, I. I've always I'm always worried about his age and potential health, but I don't see it changing, man. He's he's good, and I know he's hurt right now, but it's a it's a fracture in his leg. I'm not worried about that as much. Of uh, he he was still throwing 95 or whatever with a fractured leg. I, I'm not too worried about that. Yeah, this is one of those guys where like you look back and you're like, oh, what was I thinking? Not drafting yeah. him everywhere last year, yep. you know? Like you just look at it. So his ERA over the last. You know, five seasons, 362, 313, 305, 474, 334. Where's the outlier, right? 474 in 2020. Then you're like, okay, his whip, the same period of time, 119, 116, 108, 139, 104. What's the outlier? The shortened 2020 season. You know, the strikeouts are always there. And then you look at the Babbitts, it's like 294. 283, 298, 355, 267. What's the outlier? I mean, 267 is a little bit of an outlier, but the 355, yeah. right? In 2020, you know, the yep. season that he struggled. Um, you know, and you could just kind of do that for every single metric. But when you look at it, it's like K minus walk rate the last five seasons 18.3, 19.7, 23.2. Even last year, 18.8, and then 20.9% last year. Swinging strike rate. 12, uh, 10.9, 11.9, 12.9, 12.1, 12.3. I mean, you can go through this in every single one of hit one of the categories. And what it is, is he's just consistently excellent. Yeah. And outside of 2020, which we know he struggled with a lot of injuries, he was, he's been fantastic. And so as long as he's healthy, you know, and then the broken leg is something that you worry a lot less about than, you know, you do like if it were something more structural, like, a you know, like muscle or a shoulder or something like that. But a broken leg is something that heals, that can heal fine. Especially with a full off season. Like I'm not worried about that at all. Totally. So he's just, he's, yeah, he's Charlie Morton. He's beautiful. And he's like a really supposed to be a really interesting dude. So yeah, he's, he seems pretty cool. And, and the more he kind of last year's little run to the world series, that little run run to the world series, you got to see a lot more of Charlie Morton, which was fun to see as well. Like that personality, you heard his teammates talking about him when he got hurt and everything. And it makes you like, go, okay, I get it. But it's like you said, we've seen this with when we've done these reviews with other players, like, like Brandon Lau and some uh, Paul Goldschmidt. There's like, what, why do we pass on these guys? They're just like, literally you can almost write their numbers down and they're maybe not elite, but they're very, very, very good like numbers and Charlie Morton, like you read them off and you can go deeper if you want. Like here's the occasional four, but then another three years in a row, like three, six, three, seven. It's just, that's what he does time and time again. And, and the thing with him is even if he gets you that four ERA, which would stink, sure. So he gets you a ton of strikeouts, a ton. And if you look at his Braves rotation, they're still pretty young and pretty, they need help still. So he's going to be out there throwing as much as he can. That was the one thing about Charlie. I remember from DFS, especially, second half of the season when the Braves were really having rotation issues, they let him go as long as he could in every single start. He was throwing 110 to 120 pitches. It felt like at least a hundred plus in every single start. He was going, going and going. So yeah, Chucky, Chucky's a guy I'm with you. I'm mad that I did not have nearly enough of last year. And now you got to pay for him a little more, but he's still a fun one to, uh, to circle. That's for sure. All right. Uh, Brandon Woodruff was 15th. Jacob DeGrom, even though he missed a ton of time, was still 16th, which is uh, just a testament to how good he really, really was. Kinley Jansen was 17th. He had a great season. But number 18, uh, Freddie Peralta, $18.90. Wanted to discuss him for a bit, up to 144 innings pitched. The fun part with Freddie Peralta last year, Toby, is we knew how good he was. We were pumped on it. He was working on, like I believe, a third pitch. That was a lot of documented stuff in spring and even just talks going into that. But the problem was, is all the discussions was how many innings you going to throw. The Brewers said they let all their guys throw 100 more than they threw the year before, all those kind of things. But Peralta the year before was 29 innings. The year before that, 85. Like, you're kind of curious on where were they going to go with Freddie Peralta. And then to come into the season, it was like him and Josh Lindblom were supposed to be sharing close opener roles together. Mm, like a team Josh Lindblom. Huh? Yeah, I, I, a lot of those shares. Um, they were supposed to be piggybacking with that. That lasted a whole one outing. And he made 27 starts after that. And he was outstanding. 281 ERA, which was beautiful. 
the uh, 30, almost 34% K rate. That's three straight 30 plus percent K rates. The walks are still up there. That's just what he's done his whole career. Nine, seven, nine, six, nine, seven. That's what he's been the last three seasons. But the, the K to walk percentage is elite. Um, this guy's darn good. Just another just amazing pitcher in Milwaukee. And we got questions coming up about the Milwaukee Brewers, but Freddie Peralta just wanted to bring him up because this is a guy that going into the draft season, there are question marks on similar to Urias on how would he be used. Well, if you said screw it and took Freddie Peralta, you got rewarded. Yeah, um, he was he was absolutely phenomenal. And I think what's remarkable about him is he's he he's essentially gone from a guy who had two pitches, you know, and that was kind of the critique of him to now he's got you know, almost four pitches, you know, and he doesn't throw, you know, the curveball and the changeup that much. You know, he threw them about 250 times each, but they're serviceable enough pitches. We always knew that the four seam fastball played um, and the slider is devastating. So he's got the repertoire to go deeper into games. So when it comes to the innings pitch, it's just a matter of, you know, him, um, you know, he had that 144 innings. I imagine he's going beyond that. Um, you know, if he gets into the one sixties with what he was able to accomplish, I think there was some luck in his favor. You know, the Babbitt was super low at two thirty, which isn't necessarily that surprising because he's an extreme fly ball pitcher. Um, his career Babbitt is two seventy though. So he's still overplaying that a little bit. Strand rate was, was pretty high at 79%, but he limits home runs, you know, 1.04 for his career under one, well under one over his last 170 innings pitched. K minus walk rate, you mentioned the walk rate being high, but the K minus walk rate, you know, 24% last year, the swinging strike is stri strike rate is there. You know, he doesn't get ch uh, chases on pitches outside the zone, which I think is that one weakness, right? Where that could turn him into an absolutely dominant That's player why if he was able to, to do it. it. Yeah. Change up the curveball could help that a lot. If he could, you know, yeah. um, but the walk rate, you know, the walk rate isn't a problem if he's not, if he's not giving up home runs and he's not giving up hits, you know, and that's kind of what he did last year. And that's not to say that he'll be able to do it to the same extent this year, but he's still got like a decent amount to fall to still be an incredibly valuable player. And I think there's also something to be said about, you know, the guy pitching, I mean, the NL central, Yes, is going to be weak. I mean, you're going to have the Reds who are going to be weaker, much weaker than they were last year. You're going to have the Pirates who are going to be the Pirates. You're going to have the Cubs who I actually like a few of the things that the Cubs have done in terms of guys that they've signed and chances that they've taken. I think they may be a little bit better than people expect, but they're still not going to be great, right? Um, he doesn't have to face his own lineup. And then the other team that I'm forgetting about Cardinals. is the Cardinals, right? So yeah. the Cardinals have the best offense in that division. And, you know, so, I mean, what about doing like a Brewer stack for pitching? No, 100%. Like, it's just, it's Burns, impossible. Burns, Burns and Woodruff. You could it's do impossible. Burns and Woodruff. No, uh, if you had the turn, you have to have the turn. Yeah, yeah, If you're on the Burns, turn. Burns I mean, has to fall. What's Woodruff going right now? Woodruff's Woodruff going is going to 16. 16, but a max yeah. of 23. So there's yeah, some you, volatility you there. You can get lucky. You could get it. I mean, Burns, three, max of 14. He's going average pick a nine. So you get Burns at nine. Yep. Woodruff falls to you. At, I can never figure out what it is going back at like, what is that? Like pick 20 or something like that. Yeah. So you can get lucky. Woodruff falls down to pick 20. Then hater falls. You pick him up in the third round. In the fourth round, you pick up Peralta. I mean, wow. it's possible. It's possible. It's I freaky, wouldn't but it's possible. say not to do it, but um, no, I mean, I think, I think it's a great situation. All those brewers pitcher pitchers are in a, a great situation to thrive generally. I remember when those guys would face like a, a weekend series in Wrigley. I think they combined for like 40 something strikeouts. It'd feel like, like it was ridiculous what they would do to te the, that team. It was, it was fierce. So it'll be fun to see. Yeah. Peralta's going around pick 48. What we have questions on maybe the new newest addition to this club, Mr. Ashby later on in the show, we'll talk about him, but um, what the Brewers are doing there is legit. So it'll be fun to see. And, you know, just hanging out with Woodruff and Burns, you'd have to imagine those tertiary pitches are going to start getting better and better. So, like, it's just it, you see it with all these good teams. When we were kids, the Braves, the guys like Steve Avery would show up and all of a sudden learn how to pitch because of Smoltz, Glavin, and Maddox. Like, these guys, you just you sit there like and just be a sponge. 
you'll learn a lot, a lot of stuff from these pitchers. So Bueller's talked about how much he's learned from just Kershaw. Like there's the little things you can do. So if Peralta plays it right, which I think he will, that, that could be another gigantic step for sure. All right, the 19th pitcher we have coming up here at $17.80, Jose Barrios. I wanted to bring him up because he seems to kind of get shunned in the fantasy community. Is like, oh, you have to pay a lot. He's nothing special. Well, 192 innings. That's 192 plus innings in three straight full seasons of baseball. 32 starts in each of those three seasons. So he's about as reliable as it comes. The ratios in all three of those seasons below, like 3-8 or below, which is, is very, very good for the ERA. The strikeouts, best he's had at 26% this past year. But in each of the last three full seasons, he's put up uh, 23 or more. Uh, he's put up 25 or more in the last four, if you even count the small season. The walks were down to 5-8 at best of his career last year. So his first year, but K to walk over 20%. I love Jose Barrios. Um, he did this even transitioning to the NL or the AL East when he went to the Jays last year. Could be a problem like we talked about with Gossman. If they do go to Dunedin, we'll see. But um, I, I'm a big fan of Barrios, and he gets he just gets clowned all the time. But year after year, just keeps getting it done. If that strikeout rate can stay, and he's technically done it for like one and a half seasons now because that 60 game season. So uh, we're actually, and then like I said, 2018, 25. percent So he's done like two and a half seasons. That's something to really like, and I believe I believe you'd probably know for sure. He feels like one of those guys that also had his velocity jump a little bit. I could be wrong, could be wrong with Rios, but uh, I know he, he the strikeouts were there, and I'm like I'm, I'm in on him again this year. Yeah, he's interesting. He's actually one of the first guys we're looking at where there's just a there's kind of there's a bit of a massive hole I'm seeing, which is. You know, he had a 26.1% strikeout rate last year, which is the highest of his career. And yet he had the lowest swinging strike rate since 2017 at 9.9%, which is very low, very low. His in-zone contact rate was up 86.1%, which is in line with what he's done in the past. Um, And then even his CSW is in line with what he's done in the past as well. So I think this is an actually, it was actually down a slightly, just like 0.1, 0.2 from the past couple of years. So I actually think, so I think what happens with Barrios, I mean, he's been remarkably consistent, like you mentioned before. I think he got lucky last year with that strikeout rate being as high as it did, as it was. If the steals continue to be what they have been in the past, I think he's falling back down in that 23 to 25% range. And I think those probably become, they probably become walks. You know, I'm going to look something up in a second. I would guess that in full counts, he got super lucky last year. Would be my guess on this. I'm just going to throw it out there on the podcast. I'll look it up in a second. But the the strikeout rate bump is not really supported by the underlying metrics. And so I think he's going to fall closer to what he's been in the past. So instead of that mid three ZRA, I think you're looking more at that three, eight ERA guy. So the one Oh six whip, you're looking at that one, one, four, that one, two, two, which isn't bad at all. I mean, especially with 192 innings, he's going to be on the blue Jays. He should get, you know, a decent amount of wins, but I do think that he overperformed and got a little bit lucky last year. Um, you know, so that's what I'll say there. Um, which is not to say I don't, Uh, I don't not like him. I mean, I think he's like totally solid, good to go. Let me see what what the projections say for him. Actually, he'd be an interesting projections guy. Um, If I could find him, Barrios. Yeah, I mean, he's just so, it's so, it's so like cliche, but he's like $17, which is probably exactly what he was last year. You know, he he made made $17.80 last year. Yeah, so he's like <laughs> 1720 on my spreadsheet in his projections, 74, you know, and 73. You know, he's going at an ADP of 73 and he's the 84th 74th ranked player. He's just like super just blah. solid, you know. Yeah, just yeah. just blah, like there there doesn't appear to be any upside. We kind of saw the upside I think last year maybe. Um so anyways, now I'm going to go down a rabbit hole while you talk and try to find out if he was among like if he was if he was had a weird um full count thing going on yeah i remember last year like going into draft season he was going right on kyle hendricks and i kept telling people or he's going right after him or something I'm like 
if you're just looking for an innings eater, go get Jose Barrios for cheaper than Kyle Hendricks because that's the one thing I loved about Barrios is he's constantly eating up innings, never crushed you really in anything like ratios. Like you said, three eight and one one four, whatever, still fine, still good. Um, now you have to pay a little more, like you said, he's like ADP of seventy three, so that's a little different. But uh, there's you can almost he's almost one of those guys you can kind of just write down in your book for like at least one eighty innings wise. Go get me like a three eight even if you want to be like really you know cautious with your expectations. Overall, still pretty solid numbers. So I, I like what you give it from him, and he allows you to take chances on some younger arms if you want to per se by going and getting a guy like Barrios. That's why I like him. I agree, and I'm curious to see what you came up with. So he was he w- well he wasn't like at the extremes, but he was 18th best in baseball with a 12.6 percent. K minus walk rate in um, in those settings in uh, in full counts. He had the fifteenth best strikeout rate in full counts. Now what I have to do is look up Barrios's career, yeah, previous seasons or something. Yeah, and see and see what uh, see what he has done in previous seasons for this. So I'd imagine. All- I'd imagine you are correct when you, when you look at it because he's never been that that kind of. But then again, like I said, he was twenty six percent ish, twenty six three or whatever last year. But in twenty twenty, he was twenty five, and twenty eighteen, he was twenty five percent. So he hasn't been like crazy far off in strikeouts. Bubba, I don't want to say I'm a genius, but <laughs> so check this out. This is this is Jose Barrios, and this is actually a thing that you can look at for players to identify guys who got particularly lucky or unlucky in um in in full counts so jose barrios can you you tell people where you go to find that at uh yeah so if you go you can go to fan graphs and then you go to split leaderboard and then you go to uh filter by count and then you just pick three and two and then you go to advanced and then uh uh, in the tabs in in um fan graphs and then you choose k minus walk rate so jose barrios's career year by year K minus walk rate in full counts. 2021, 12.6%. 2018, 1.9%. <laughs> 2020, negative 2.2%. Oh my. 2019, negative 2.3%. 2017, negative 7.9%. So that's pretty lucky. 2016, negative 15.6%. So he did almost 11% better in full counts. And so if we look at him strikeouts, 37.9% last year, 32.7%, 32.6%, 27.9%, 23.7%, 22.2%. And when we look at walks, lowest by 5% last year. So essentially what happened to Jose Barrios last year is he got super lucky on both ends of the spectrum when he had a 3-2 count. And the result of that was more strikeouts and lower walks than he deserved and an ERA lower than he probably deserved. So lock it up, Jose Barrios. You're not that good. You're just the same guy you've always been, which is perfectly good, but not as good as last year. So what are you going to do with that 74th ranking on your chart? I mean, it's, it's probably factored in, right? That's yeah, what's great a, about projections. That's yeah. That's what like the projections have him beautifully at a 3.9 ERA, a 1.22 yep. whip, 200 innings and 196 innings pitched. Yep. They have a 24.3% K rate. They have a 6.7% walk rate, you know? So they kind factor all that in. Yep. That's why we listen to projections and not yep. to what he did last year. That's the beauty of it. That's why I think it's fun because we could say he overachieved, which he did, hundred percent. Like the the information is right there. You mentioned it all, but even without it, the projections and all this, the goodies, he's still a pretty legit option. Like he's still like a good guy to grab because the biggest thing for him, and it's like I, I probably beat it like a dead horse, is the innings because he is accumulator. He accumulates, accumulates because. Mm-hmm. If you watch his day-to-day start, again, this is where the DFS part of me comes into play. Like, I would rarely ever roster him in DFS, ever, because he barely had big strikeout games. He'd have, like, occasionally an eight-strikeout eight game or whatever, but and you need those for points. 
So he's more of a five or six K guy, which is great for a season long. If he's going to go throw 30 plus starts, phenomenal. It's 180 plus strikeouts or whatever. Great. But um, he's never that guy. He's not like a Freddie Peralta. Who's going to go out there and put up 12 K's or nine K's or like he's going to, he's, he's not going to get that for you very often. So that's where the projections for the innings makes him really, really great. And that's where you have to kind of go back and forth and go, okay, do you trust the innings guy that's done it time and time again? I want to just go quote unquote safe and, just hope it doesn't blow up in your face, which can't happen. Or do you take a chance on this younger guy that's a flamethrower that strikes out everybody that's going to take a potential innings jump that we just don't know. It's a potential thing. That's a whole other discussion for another day, but that's kind of the fun between the two, and that's why Berrios is boring, but it's a very good boring. Sometimes boring is good. It just is. You suck it up and roll with it, and then you can kind of have the flashy Tristan McKenzie fun later on or something like that. So that's where it gets interesting. All right, a couple more guys I did want to hit on here before we go to the listener questions. I did want to go to number 20, Joe Musgrove. He made $17.60, just behind Barrios here. Uh, Musgrove, he's been a very, very hot topic of conversation in the draft streets right now because he's going pretty high, going around like guys like Luis Castillo and a few others. But he had 181 innings pitched last year, 32 total starts. He was really good at the no-no. Or was it a perfect game or a no-no? I know he had no, no, for sure. No, no, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, in Texas, because Texas was good for that. Um, but he had a three one eighty ERA, three seven FIP, three six five X FIP. Strikeouts were great, twenty seven percent K rate. The walk rate was decent at seven two, almost twenty percent K to walk. Very, very good. He's a guy that I I struggle to wrap my head around to keep jumping back in on. That's just one thing with him because I look at his overall career and great in two thousand nineteen, but there's been like. He's never this good. This was by far his career season. Um, it was great, but are there things to be concerned with here, or is this the guy you think we're getting? What are you seeing from him in his performance in 2021? Before we get into that, I just want to let you guys know that whenever you are looking at Joe Musgrove's profile, you should go over to YouTube and just Google Joey by, by Bob Dylan and listen to the chorus on repeat. It's just... <laughs> it's great. I highly recommend doing that. Um, yeah, I think Musgrove was pretty lucky last year. Like when I look at yeah. what's going on, like, you know, he had the 318 ERA and the 108 whip. He had a career low BABIP at 266. And I know it's kind of like cheap just to like focus on BABIP and things like that. But there's a reason why people look at like BABIP a lot because it can tell you like where on the luck spectrum they they really were. Um, 266 BABIP, so a career low, actually, you know, almost 30 points and 25 po points lower than, you know, his previous low BABIP was. His fly ball rate did increase slightly, so that might explain some of it, but certainly not all of that um, as well. You know, highest strand rate of his career as well. You know, the 19.9% K minus walk rate is great. 12.7% swinging strike rate is also solid. You know, um, he did give a little bit, like he's always been a really low walk guy. He definitely gave in a little bit there. What was fascinating is that he, you know, his pitch mix just changed so dramatically. Like he stopped throwing any fastballs. He threw 26.9% fastballs, 28% sliders, 17% cutters, 24% curveballs, you know, and 5% changeups. And so he really like, you know, he just stopped throwing the fastball. And I think that was one of the reasons why he was so successful. But I feel like he also was somebody who got who got worse as the season progressed. Um, I don't know if I'm if I'm making that up. Um, and I'm not sure whether that was like hitters adapting was, to it. I feel like he was battling injuries as the season went on, if I remember correctly. Was it? If I remember, I, mean, I could be wrong. That's what, that's what it felt like. He was kind uh, of a mixy matchy type guy. Yeah, pretty consistent. The O swing dropped, the walk rate, you know, increased as well. So he was, he seems like he was pretty consistent, you know, at least over those last 10 games. Walk rate really shot up and the swinging strike rate really dipped towards the end of the year. O swing dipped as well. So there was something going on there. Z contact went up as well. Something going on towards the end of last year. Um, let's just check really quickly to see what his velocity was doing at that point in time. His velocity was actually going up. So um, who knows? And that's all to say, I think he's like a little, he's probably not as good as he was last year. There's obviously room for growth. You know, he could become a better pitcher. He's still really young, which I think is great. You know, he's 29. Feels like he's been around forever, but 
finally broke out last year. So I think he's solid. Like, again, he's very, I think he'll end up somewhere similar to Barrios, honestly. Um, you know, with like maybe less volume than Barrios, but kind of that mid, mid to high threes ERA strikeouts about the same, you know, um, solid enough. I yeah, know he's, he's just an interesting one for me. It's hard for me to pull the, the trigger on at his draft price because I just, the career year thing, but we'll see. We'll see what happened with him. Uh, Max Freed was 20, uh, 21st overall. The second half was great. Well-documented all over the Twitter sphere. Uh, Lance Lynn was 22nd. Alex Reyes was 23rd. But remember, Gallegos took over eventually, and that one disappeared. The last name I wanted to discuss here, and we could discuss many, many more if we if we have more time, but um, Frankie Montas was 24th at $16.60. And I bring him up because he's going around Joe Musgrove, Luis Castillo. I put a, a Twitter poll out there yeah, a, week, a week ago. It's and an interesting grouping. A very interesting grouping. And Frankie Montas... It seemed like you either loved him or there's a lot of backlash on why he's here. And I'm I'm a Frankie Montas fan. I agree with some of the sentiments about the concerns with Frankie Montas. I get it because you it's a roller coaster ride at times with Frankie Montas. But the beauty, like we've talked about so many times, is it's a full season. So you got to ride the roller coaster if you trust in the guy's actual you know goods. Basically, he made 32 starts, even though it was a roller coaster. 187 innings pitched. Um, a 337 ERA, 337 FIP, 364 XFIP. Uh, the ground ball rate, 42.8%, not his best, but a pretty darn good one. Overall, the home run to fly ball dropped quite a bit, but 26.6% K rate. He was very good. The splitter was back in action. And that was the thing we've talked about in years past with, Fra- with Fra- Frankie. If the splitter's there, we're good. If the splitter's not there, we're in trouble. It was there. And he finished. The thing I loved about him, you mentioned how Musgrove kind of struggled towards the end of the season. Frankie Montas, filthy for like the last month, maybe month and a half. He's another guy in DFS. You just played him every time out because he was getting you nine plus strikeouts every start, going six or seven innings every start. He was the main reason the A's basically almost got to the postseason. He was the ace. Him and Chris Bath with the basket got hit. Montas was awesome. So I'm a guy believing in Montas from what I saw in 2021. Tell me if I'm wrong. Am I missing something with how good he was last year, especially the way he finished the season? Mm. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the overall body of work, it's really good. Um, you know, just like the ERA, um, the innings, the strikeouts, there's nothing that jumps out. Like the BABIP isn't that weird. You know, the strand rate isn't that weird. The walk rate is nice, especially like he... He's only had two seasons where he's had really above average um, chase rate on pitches outside the zone. And last year was one of them, you know, and again, it totally aligns with the splitter splitter usage. Like you mentioned, he was decent inside the zone, slightly better than league average inside the zone was getting, you know, ahead of batters more so than in the past and was actually in the zone less. So he didn't have to be in the zone as much um, as he was previously. I was just looking at his rolling average graph here for the last 10 games of the season. And there was a little bit of concerning stuff happening there. Um, just with the, um, you know, his, his, uh, his contact rate was up, you know, against O swing was really nice, but the K rate dropped, the swinging strike rate dropped, the walk rate increased pretty dramatically over those last 10 games. And so I'm just wondering if there was something going on there. Yeah, like really bumped up. Let me see something. This is the beauty of all short, you listeners. He had, he had a very short outing in Kansas City in those last 10 games. He got destroyed. Um, I don't know if that'll affect the whole package for you. but He um, started throwing the fastball four-seamer more, sinker a little bit more. Did he move away from the splitter? Yeah, he started throwing the splitter less towards the end of the year. He was up as high as 31% during kind of his most successful, at least skills-wise, point. And then that dropped all the way down to 24.2%. I wonder what that's all about. And all of the metrics kind of went in the wrong direction um, as a result of that. So I'm not exactly sure. The one last thing that I wanted to check was just... um, Kind of his the velocity on his pitch. I know he had a back. I know he had a back injury, but that shouldn't affect his splitter usage. So. Yeah, and See, his and, it, and his his velo seems fine. 
I mean, that's that, the, that's the concern with the splitter. Like, if you lose it, it changes. That's why it was my concern with Gossman at all times. Montas navigated it, but is that a thing for the full season? I would trust. That's yeah. Tough. I mean, the thing I'll say is Drew Sweeney's strike rate, even though it was down, was still 14.1%. So it's still yeah. really good. And the O swing was still really good. So, you know, just maybe like a couple couple smaller cracks, but overall really like it. And it's an interesting grouping. And if you were to look at, if you were to look at the projections that I have, they have Luis Castillo as the worst of that group at $15. They have Frankie Montas as, as second worst at about $16. And then they have Jose Barrios second worst of that grouping at $17. And then they have Musgrove as the most at about $18. So all like $3 within them, which can be, you know, that's like 10 One strikeouts or, two, or something yeah. like that. It's not, it's not a lot. Um, but that's kind of how the projections at the steamer projections, at least at this point kind of rank them out, which I think is, is kind of, it's kind of a reasonable, I think. Um, yeah, it's kind of reasonable. I think some of them may have a higher higher ceiling than Barrios. I think we may have kind of seen the best of Barrios last year. But we'll and that's that's the fun discussion. Like when you're building your team, is like you want the boring, quote unquote, safe Barrios, or do you want to go for the gusto? Because like you know, Luis Castillo, if he figures it out for like one year, if he goes Robbie Ray on us and stops walking guys, that's terrifying. What he could do, that's a big if, a humongous if. Uh, can Frankie Montas like build off of this and go to like that next ace level? Maybe, but he could also like all these guys can regress. Can Musgrove do it again? Like, there's so many questions here, but I agree. They, the three of them definitely have a higher ceiling than Barrios, especially just pitching in the AL East alone is going to down him quite a bit compared to the other three guys. And you know, you got then you got Castillo and Great American Small Park for now, unless he gets traded. So that could change things. But you got Montas and Oko, which is outstanding. And then yeah. Musgrove and Petco is not too shabby either. So it's just those little things like when you're trying to to, tie, to get the tiebreakers. You have to like kind of break it down a little farther, and that helps for sure if you're not just using the projections and, and the, the dollars like you did to kind of make it a little easier. But um, it'll be a fun discussion for the next few months because those guys, I've seen a few other polls with those similar players in them because it is an interesting grouping. And I think a lot of it comes down to your roster construction. Do you want to take chances there? Do you want to take chances elsewhere? That'll be a fun discussion as uh, time goes on. All right, let's get a little, few listener questions in here before we head on out for the weekend, or for the week, I should say. Um, let me find them. I had them. Okay, Jeff Zimmerman starts off our questions for us. How do you value pitchers who, ha- who have or might throw out of the bullpen to start or to start the season or for some of the season or even start the year in the minors? So kind of the Freddie Peralta idea before he goes bonkers. Um, examples like Ashby, Javier, Hauk, um, Ronaldo Lopez, etc. It's a great question. That's why Jeff asked it, of course. Um, I have my thoughts, but I'll let you go first on what do you what do you do with these types of arms? Well, I think just from like an evaluation standpoint, I would evaluate them initially in the same way, just kind of like breaking down the metrics, you know, looking at the projections, all of that standard stuff. Um, there's nothing rocket scientist wise there. I think Jeff's done a lot of research. So the question coming from him is, you know, appropriate, like just in terms of velocity decreases that guys have, you know, when they move from, you know, the bullpen to, to the rotation, you know, um, things of that nature. So trying to factor that into it generally. Um, so this isn't going to be like as quantitative of an answer, I think maybe as it should be, but I think one other thing to, to think about as well is like how you're building out your, your, um, your rotation. So like, if you feel pretty good about your innings, like if you have those frontline starters or you have that bulk, you have that volume and you, because I think in today's game, like those middle relievers have, they can have tremendous value. Like we've seen it kind of year in and year out. I think sometimes it's difficult to know who those guys are going to be because they kind of come out of nowhere. Right. Um, even the guys that, Jeff mentioned in there are fall into that. Like we, not many people were probably thinking that Ashby was going to be like a league winner towards the end of the season there. Um, so I think, you know, if you have the right, if you feel like you can have volume and again, a little bit different draft and hold versus a regular, um, a regular season. And then if you also have your closers locked down, like if you have your two lockdown closers, I actually think it's really nice to potentially have a guy like that, just like a very high skilled, kind of quasi reliever starting pitcher 
that you can kind of move in on those weeks where you um, don't. So maybe like, I don't know if this is like, this isn't a very good com comparison, but it was in my head. So I'll say it, you know, kind of like that multi-position eligibility that you get, you know, during, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from your guys, like it allows you to be a little bit more flexible and maybe sit some guys where you have question marks about whether they should be starting for you and put them in there um, without, without too much weakness. And there's actually a really good article in the process, which Jeff wrote, um, you know, that talks a little bit about like what, what the value of, you know, middle relievers are like, what's the difference between, you know, in the, in the grouping of pitchers that is kind of available on a week to week basis on the waiver wire, you know, what is the difference between them and say like your middle reliever. And it's actually interesting. Like the difference in the percentage of, of the time that they get wins is actually not that different. You know, so I think in a lot of situations, instead of streaming some guys outside of two start pitchers, you know, streaming questionable guys, those those types of middle middle relievers can be really valuable. Um, you know, so I don't know if that answers Jeff's question because it's not really like quantitative or like you know from like a a um, I don't know. It's more of a qualitative approach, I guess, that I would take, and more about. Yeah, just thinking about like the whole context and uh, of your roster and your rotation and and kind of how it fits in there. And I think that's one thing that I would really like to get better at is because I think I'm a little impatient and I'm a little like I take risks when I don't have to. And actually, there's another piece in the process. I would highly recommend the process. I know Jeff didn't send in this question so that I could just like talk about how great the process is, um, but there's just a really good. Um, uh, there's a really good article in there about, I just lost my train of thought going off on the process. About taking um, chances. About taking chances. That's where you're um, going. That's where you kind of wrap. Oh man. There's so many good studies in the process that mm -hmm. it's hard to remember which one it is. Um, oh man. I can't <laughs> remember. Shoot. But it's, it's in the same section of the book as the other, as the other one, as the other one is, is in there. Um, now you have to buy the book. Darn it. Yeah. Well, there's another one that like goes into like when you should invest in a middle reliever, you know, like what are some of the, and it's more qualitative than quantitative, like thinking about um, really just stuff. Like if you're going to stream them for the week, like did they not throw the last two weeks? So it's likely that they're going to throw that first time you know, only going after guys who throw more than one inning at a time, stuff like that. Anyways, I just go read the process, people. Jeff, go read your own book. <laughs> the way I look at it um, is like roster construction, where Toby was going with that at one point in time, is uh, one area of it for me. I, I, the, the lazy answer is drafts and holds. I like them a lot more because I love the ability to use them on certain weeks, like kind of what you're talking about. Of, instead of streaming certain pitchers, I can throw them out. I have a lot of Christian Javier, but I like him because he threw over 100 innings last year, so he could easily slide into a, like a fifth starter spot and throw you 150. Like I'd have, I'd be very confident in that. Where some of these other guys, like Ronaldo Lopez, we love to get out of the bullpen, but do I trust him going back in the rotation and having the bullpen guy, which talks about Jeff's other you know, the velocity changes, and then Lopez goes back to the old Lopez. Like which one do you get here? That's a big concern. Some guys are better suited for the bullpen than the starter. Christian Javier, he made spot starts, he did it all, and he was. Pretty darn phenomenal the whole time. I love Tanner Houck, but I don't know if they're going to let him go deep. And that's already been kind of the talks before the lockdown happened is they love what he's doing. They love kind of moving him in and out and probably no more than four to five innings even this next year. That could change. Let's keep an eye on that. And then the Ashby thing, like you said, he won a thing for you. So I have no problem with it if you're making the roster. I think the, the, the way Toby was talking about, I think the biggest thing, and I've been a huge proponent of this. I've talked about picking guys up on Fab that do this all the time. Like I've been a huge – proponent of these longer reliever type guys um i think in drafts in like re fab leagues it's not kind of focused on enough it was more last year because as like kopech went early and everything they kind of opened the door to this idea so i think it will be more popular this year if that makes sense but um i think a good time to start looking at them is either knowing how you can backfill your pitchers like being confident in that so because some of these guys are going to take early because the, the helium is going to keep coming up on guys like Ashby. Or go and get your start, your couple starters, like Toby mentioned. Make sure you got your closers or whatever you, your plan is for closing figured out. 
And then before going and taking like a Patrick Corbin per se, go take a chance on one of these guys that you can kind of mix and match things with. I think in a, in a redraft, you can do something like that, but I think they're much more popular this year. I like, I like using them more this year. I'd rather use one of these guys than running out like a Matt Manning type situation, stuff like that. So I think there's a lot more to be said in especially 15 team leagues, maybe not so much in 12 teams because you have so much more depth to play off of there, but in a 15 team league, these guys are going to have a, a lot of viability on rosters. So yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of it, Jeff. And I think we're going to see a lot more of them drafted this year in redraft formats. All right. The next question we have here is from John H. Does Jordan Montgomery have another level in him? I mean, Jomo. Very popular. Yeah, Jomo. Jomo? People love Jomo. People love Jomo. What, what is the other nickname? What's the other nickname that people have for him that's horrible? Jamont? Jamont. Jomo, because it's like from. Um, um, it's from Game of Thrones. Jormont is from Game of Thrones, so they use the Joe Mont type thing. But I thought he was on here, but he's not. So go as you were. Oh yeah, I mean, I think that there's definitely potential there. Um, I think there was a tweet that I saw earlier that was talking about how Montgomery has, um, Montgomery has is one of. Oh, I think it was our friend Ryan Bloomfield. Yep, he has two pitches that are twenty yep. percent swinging strike rate. And the really good pitches, his curveball it and was his a changer. hashtag bloom board. Yeah, it was. Um, and I mean, based on this question, you know, it's like you're like, oh man, Jordan Montgomery must have been bad last year. He was awesome last year, but he was good last year. Yeah. And I mean, and so maybe the question is like, he was good last year. Does he have like that next level? Yep. Potentially. I mean, 157 innings, 383 ERA, 128 whip. You know, and even with that 128 whip, like the BABIP's a little high, you know, the walk rate is a little high, which is surprising because he always has a really high O swing. Um, he gets a lot of chases on pitches outside the zone. Like he had his highest first pitch strike rate. You know, he had his second highest O swing. You know, the zone rate was lower, but you know, it still is a recipe for a better walk rate than that. And then he had a 13.7% you know, swinging strike rate um 28.4 csw isn't great but like yeah i mean i think there's a lot there i think he's potentially you know very good he's you know who he actually reminds me of a lot now that we're thinking about it um is is uh is joe musgrove he looks a lot like joe musgrove he's got two really good breaking pitches he's no longer throwing you know his fastball or at least 38.2 percent of the time so more than Musgrove, but less than 40% of the time. So on that curveball, 25%, change up 25%, that cutter, 13.7%. Let's take a look at just like what he did towards the back end of the season um, here, which I know is like super exciting for all of you who are he was awesome listening, to the, the li the listening to the podcast. And you're just like, wow, Toby's looking something up right now <laughs> on his computer. And then he's going to regurgitate it to us. Uh, so his Z contact was the lowest that it was throughout the year over his last 10 games. Um, the O swing was as strong as ever. K rate was 25%. Walk rate was 8.2%. So slightly elevated there. Swinging strike rate was 14.6%, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, that's really good as well. If we break it down to five games, I mean, that stuff's even better. Yep. It's even better the over the last five games. Oh, man. 76% Z contact over his last five games, 30% strikeout rate, 36% O swing, 16% swinging strike rate, 7.8% walk rate. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a 22%, almost 23% K minus rock rate over those last five games. And what were those last five games? They were the face the Orioles <laughs> once. They were the Rays, that. in which he gave up seven earned runs in two yep. and two thirds. Yep. But then he had a great outing against the Red Sox, a great yep. outing against the Rangers, great outing against the Orioles, and then he got roughed up a little bit by the Mets. So you know, um, some like good, some bad there. But again, like it's interesting. I should have looked up did his velocity increase over that point in time, or was there a pick, pitch mix change? I mean, that's what we really want to be looking at there. So let's see. His fastball percent over his last five games. Interesting. It actually shot up. 
He started throwing more fastballs. He was attacking the zone. Maybe. Well, he stopped throwing his sinker. That's he always a good thing. He throwing his sinker, and he That's started throwing his, throwing his four-seam fastball. That's a good thing, kids. Probably gave up a lot of home runs, too. And then, but what, it, let's see. Okay. And did he increase his change in curve usage? He in, increased his change-up usage, decreased the curve usage as well. His ERA was 604, so he didn't have the results. And I think that's maybe what's sticking in people's minds. Um, so let's see. His BABIP, his strand rate, and his home run per fly ball over that period of time. So home run per fly ball was at 20.8%. So super elevated, the highest it had been since a period of the season earlier in the year. His BABIP was 431 during that stretch and his strand rate was 67.7%. So that's like how over those small samples, somebody who's displaying really good skills like Jomo was how that can really be lost in the shuffle because yeah, one bad start, basically <laughs> one bad start and a 431 Babbitt against and a 20.8% home run per fly ball, you know? So I'm super intrigued actually, after looking at this, I'm super intrigued because I love Jomo first and foremost, but yep. Well, and I, I love the fact that he made 30 starts last year, 157 innings. And even with that bad start here and there, it's like great ratios. Like there, I think there's much more to build on here, especially pitching in that AL East. I think that's a good thing. And ditching the sinker, he could be doing the thing that we've seen like Cole and these other guys do go, hey, I'm going to just sacrifice a home run here and there, but I'm going to get more strikeouts and like limit the damage. Because that sinker might be good, but like the Babbitt could have been crazy. So there's a lot, lot to uh, potentially like with Jomo. I'm with you on that one. He's a, Popular name, so uh, be ready to pay a, a price for that. I'll go out on a limb. If you want to draft Joe Musgrove, 100 picks later, more than maybe more than 100 picks later, I don't even know. 100 picks later, just pick Jordan Montgomery. Oh, is it a Joe Musgrove? Yeah, what did I say? Oh, you said, I said, you said Joe Mo. That's why I was like, you, how do you go? 100 if you picks want later? to draft Joe Mo, 100 <laughs> picks later than Joe Mo, that's where I was you like, can't. it's impossible. <laughs> that's where I was like, no, no, no all, Joe Musgrove. Like, Who's he going to pick? <laughs> yeah. I got you. Um, Anthony Gialdi asked a question here. Which, oh God, the Royals question. Yeah, which, if any, of the KC starters do you think all. will improve or break out this year? How would you rank them? Here they are, no particular order. God. Keller, Singer, Minor, Bubich, Lynn, Cow, uh, Coer. The only one I've got a lot of shares of, and it's just pure speculation, is Brady Singer. I love the way he finished the season with his strikeout stuff, and I'm still, I'm still a believer in that pedigree. And as long as he keeps striking guys out, he's going to keep getting spots to get better. So I'm gonna. I, that's the only guy I like. Minor's injury scares me. I don't mind shares of him, but his injury scares me, but um, I'm just going to keep it short, sweet, and simple. Singer with the strikeout upside, the way he finished the season especially was very, very intriguing to me. So he's the guy that I have if I'm taking anybody from Kansas City. All right. Um, I mean, I think Singer is interesting. Um, I think there's there's the two-pitch issue with him. Yes. yes. Though, um, which I think is a challenge. I mean, honestly, like I'm not super interested in any of them. Yeah, they're um, all late game draft and hold darts. Like I doubt I'll have any of them in a fab league, any of them. Yeah, I mean, the one thing about the one thing for Singer, you know, he's got a league average K minus walk. He did have a super high Babbitt, super low strand rate. He did did limit home runs, you know, generally speaking. Um, so that's at least like, you know, maybe a little bit interesting. I was going to say Brad Keller, just cause I know he had a pitch mix change maybe in the middle of last year before he got injured and he was actually looking kind of interesting, but I looked at the numbers and it's, it's actually not that <laughs> it it's wasn't. not that interesting. <laughs> nope. <laughs> um, you know, there, who are the others? Minor and Bubich. I mean, I don't, I don't think I've ever seen anything from Bubich. Bubich, he was streamable from time to time. I know for a fact I did stream him from time to time, but it was very I, picky. He, I, he yeah. may be streamable, but is it a good idea? In you that know? division, it can be. Yeah. That division, it helps. Um, yeah, I'm not really seeing anything. So, I mean, I'd probably go with Singer just because he's like, I think, clearly the one with the most talent. The and one that... The yeah. one I'll say is interesting is Jackson Kowar. He was horrible last year in his short stint. 
but he's the one that dominated the minors probably better than almost anybody there. And so he's still super young. So there's something <clears throat> that maybe has yet to be unleashed at the next level. Maybe it won't be. We've seen that happen many times. But I remember like guys like James Anderson and stuff said, hey, this is the guy you want to pick up now if you can because he's going to come up. And he just didn't pan out. A lot of guys didn't pan out last year, at least pitching-wise, from the minors. A lot did not. And I think a lot of that could have been without the 2020 minor league season. We kind of got fooled a little bit. But Jackson Coar dominated the minors before we started getting calls. Yeah. It's still tricky. Maybe him. It's still Maybe tricky. Him. Like like you said, this it's not a great fun group. I think that's why Anthony asked this question, because very sharp NFC player just want to kind of he's probably doing the same exercise in his head, going, Okay, let's see what these guys think. I'm doing I do the same thing to so, most guests I have on my show. I like most of the questions involve something I'm curious about. So um I get what he's doing. And um Singer's the guy for me, but I could see the coar appeal. A lot of these guys are coming super cheap. And they're draft and holds. So I get it. It's better than some of the other options later on. But it's like, do you take one of these guys or do you go and take um one of like the pirates pitchers or something like that? That's you where take you take one of the pirates pitchers, honestly. Yeah. I mean, you take Will Crow, probably. Will Crow's a guy I've had circled quite a bit. So you you stop mentioning his name, please. Stop mentioning his yeah. name. Yeah. Okay. But Crow came up on a bloom board. Uh, I believe today as well. I did. So, he did. He did. Yeah. So I saw that. I was just like, yeah. I was like, damn it. There's nothing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, all right. Last question for us this evening. Charlie's with a four says thoughts on Aaron Ashby. Can he be the next Brewers pitcher to take the leap like Burns and Peralta to be a legit starter? What about, um, okay, we'll stop there. He's got two questions here. Do you believe Ashby could be the next step? I'm pretty sure most people do, but do you? Um, yeah, I mean, I think he's got everything going for him. I mean, if you look at it, like I was looking at him a little bit earlier, I think that the, the, you know, to kind of Jeff's question earlier, I think an interesting thing about Ashby is, is dependent. I mean, like there are different velocity readings. I have one that has him at 96, six on average. I have another one that has him on nine at 97, three, um, with the sinker at 96, five. So the, the reason, you know, so so he throws hard enough where he can lose a little bit and he can still be successful, you know? And I think that's, I think that's really important. Like the velocity is there um, and he's throwing from the left side. So it's even better. You know, the slider was really good. The changeup was really good. Um, he only threw the four seam a little bit. So he's more of a sinker guy. Um, probably generating a lot of ground balls with that. Yeah. 70% ground ball with the sinker. Yeah, I mean, this this is really nice. Like sinker, 70% ground ball rate. Slider, 60% ground ball rate. Change up, 55% ground ball rate. So, I mean, the dudes throws velo from the left side, you know, really strong. He's got a 61.3% ground ball rate. He's got 37% O swing. In the zone, he's not as good, but that's because of the sinker. You know, 20.3% K minus walk rate, but that's, a, that's way too high. That's way too high. Yeah. That, I mean, that's a small sample size anom uh, anomaly. If he has a 37% O swing, he's not going to walk 9% of dudes. Um, so yeah, I mean, I can see it. I can see it for sure. Um, yeah, I can see it for sure. Yeah, that's, I, I could see it a hundred percent. We kind of talked about it earlier. He's got the stuff to do it. Like you mentioned, Will he get the chance, or is he just going to be a middle reliever like Jeff asked? That's the fun part because the Brewers they like to do things not quite crazy, but they the back end of the rotation gets kind of flip flopped around a lot. So we'll see. But I could see Ashby being that guy for sure. The yeah, I mean question, he's not going to throw yeah. ten innings probably. No, yeah. that's that's the biggest concern. Like again, it goes back to like that's why I like Javier. He could easily take that jump. Like uh, I'm not worried about that, but we'll see. Um, you, the other, you, you can't replace Eric Lauer. In the rotation. No, that'd be a crime. Maybe Brett Anderson. Maybe. Let Scott Jensen maybe. answer that question. Maybe, but, but maybe. then my pitch seventh set, my seven, yeah, my fiftieth round pick is yeah. gone at the door. Useless. Um, we just got question, a question. We'll get to that in a minute. The other okay. question from Charlie. Um, what about a potential closer? Camilo Duvall, Anthony Bender, are they worth picking up? Will they get the chance to be closer for their teams? I think they'll get the chance. I think they're worth picking up. I don't think they have solid ground to stand on, though. Yeah, 
I'm going to go with it. I'm going to go with a no, I think. Yeah. I think, I, 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 I mean, I love them, now. but man, these arms are so volatile. I mean, we yeah. saw it with Doval where he started off super strong and then he struggled a little bit. Um, maybe I'm making that up, but like, maybe he just gave up a big hit one time, but like, I don't know. I mean, yeah. And then with Bender, Bender wasn't that good down the stretch. Nope. Um, you know, and that's the thing is like, there's inconsistencies and, you know, guys adjust like Bender. Let's see. Cause like when I started having him on some teams, like he wasn't that good let's see yeah like in zone contact rate was 90 percent that's not his good. O's, so his, his, his z contact was well below league average his o swing was well below league average he was striking out 19.7 percent of batters he was walking 12.1 percent of batters so as a reliever he had a seven percent walk uh, k minus walk his swinging strike rate was at 8.6 percent right i don't know what happened to him but you know, that's the thing is like he pitched off the, he was off the hook at the beginning of the year, but then he was unrosterable towards the back end of the year. And this is like the fluctuation of non elite, you know, guys. Um, let's even look at Duvall. I'm going to look at Duvall right here. Let's see what we got here. Duvall was elite to finish the season. Um, I know, I remember him being really good. Yeah, but like, yeah, yeah, that looks good. Um, just, although, yeah. like, so it's just something like, like an in zone contact rate of 90.5%, though. So he's getting a lot of chases. The K rate's great. The swinging strike rate's great. I mean, everything was beautiful for Duvall. It's actually like just a beautiful graph. I mean, you guys should check it out. Just like look <laughs> at, don't look at his Z contact, but just look at uh, O swing, swinging strike rate, K and walk percentage, 10 game rolling average for Camilo Duvall. And that'll be perfect. So, you know, maybe Duvall, but I, I don't know. I don't know. It's there's too many of these guys that come in and they flame out. And, you know, they're I just wouldn't invest a lot in them. That's my personal yeah. opinion. And you got to pay for Duvall. The uh, Bender, not so much, but you have to pay for Duvall. So I said it from every question that's been asked. I think he'll get the job to start with, but it's the Giants. And there's still McGee will be there. There's going to be other options. And if he slips up, they'll be out there quickly or they'll rotate stuff. They'll play They'll play in situations. So I just know that I think he, I, in a perfect world, he gets like 70% of the saves in a perfect world. That's the way I see it. So just have that thought going into it. It's that's why there's only like five or six like lockdown guys right now. Everybody else is up for grabs. Uh, last question we have here: Joined us in the chat. If you guys watch us live, you can jump in here. But James DeViglio asks: Ross Stripling is he any good? I'd say yes. I know we talked about him as a streaming option at times last year. I think he's definitely worth a, a draft pick in in deeper leagues right now. Uh, he's going to get you innings. Strikeout rate's not horrible. It's decent. The biggest concern I'd have is he just a placeholder for Nate Pearson. Keep that in mind. Like, how long is he in the rotation for? But to start the season, I think Ross Stripling is very, very much in play. So he is hashtag good. Yes. Yeah, he's weird. He's really weird because, yeah, at times last year, he looked really good. Um, so, like, there's, you know, times when he had a Z contact rate well below league average. And at the same time, he had an O swing that was better than league average. Um, and at the same time, he had a decent K rate and a decent swinging strike rate and a low walk rate. Like he had everything that you wanted to do. But his pitch mix is his pitch mix always and velo always seem to be a little weird. Um, let's take a look at the fastball velocity. Yeah. So, like, um, oh, whoops, that's fastball percentage. Um, yeah, fastball velocity was kind of all over the place, but, you know, peaked at 92, two. And when he was around there, he was, you know, he was pretty good. Um, but I do think like the fastball percentage is a really good, like it was really high at one point in time. And I, I can't remember where I was listening to it, but he has, let's see. So he's got this fantastic change up 19.3% swinging strike rate. 36% O swing, 73% in zone contact rate, everything that you could ever want in a pitch. And yet he, it's the pitch he throws the least. Like, what the hell is that? 
<laughs> like, why are you doing like honestly like your fastball sucks your slider sucks like your curveball sucks like why are you why aren't you throwing change-ups all the time that's Doesn't it sound that's, very that's, that's the end of the analysis i mean like the curveball has been decent in the past it hasn't been decent the last couple of years um and so yeah i mean i think that the problem with him is he's really like the the fastball's okay you know and it plays better obviously when it's uh, when velo's up the changeup is really good but he doesn't have anything else he can throw yeah no uh, that's it's it's tricky like i like him to start the season he's just not gonna be there for long i think it's pearson's job that he's holding he's place holding it for so just know that going into it i think he's worth a shot but as toby also mentioned there's concerns as well with i don't ross mean stripling. to be overly mean to ross stripling i'm just saying like it's guys like that where you're just like you're not just like not throwing your best pitch that much you're like throwing it the least like and he's a Maybe. smart dude like i've heard him on i think he was on pitcher list podcast like he seems like he's an analytically driven dude, so I'm not sure why he's not throwing that change up. Well, maybe all this downtime in the lockout, he'll see this and he'll make it work. He'll listen so to we'll this see. podcast. He'll listen to this podcast because someone will tell him that, hey, these guys are talking mad trash about you. Like I'm gonna ha- just yeah. I'm gonna hashtag Ross Stripling. There you go. And at him on the podcast yeah, when him. I put yes, it out. Be, there. be that guy. At him. No. Uh, why do you why do you stink so much? Don't at <laughs> players, guys. No. Don't do it. Like especially unless you have stuff. maybe have something really nice to yeah, say if you want to compliment them go for it but yeah. if you're going to do nasty things you're some of the worst people on twitter so i just don't go there um but that'll wrap us up on that high note we're gonna we're gonna call it there uh, it finishes our positional reviews of the 2021 season toby we'll uh start uh, doing some other stuff here get ready for the 2022 season here very shortly but any final thoughts as we wrap up the pitching department and just the, the review in general uh, no, I'm, I'm excited. I enjoyed this review process. I hope it was helpful for listeners. I'm excited to jump into the previews. I'm excited to jump into some drafts here pretty soon. Um, get going on that front and yeah, it should be a lot of fun. Should be a ton of fun for sure. But, uh, again, keep, uh, keep it coming. We'll have more and more for you this off season, but check out Toby on Twitter at bat flip crazy. I'm on Twitter at BD Entrick. This is another episode of Bubba and the bat flip episode 108. Your pitcher review for the 2021 season. We'll catch you guys later.